Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My uh, name is G. Dewey and the G in my name is anonymous. Uh, I have been in this fellowship for quite a long time. Before I go any further, I have a habit of walking away from this microphone. If you can't hear me, don't hesitate to call me. I'm not thin-skinned. Uh, I've been on, in this fellowship for quite a long time. And, uh, in fact, uh, so long that uh, a great many people refer to me as the old master. I regret to tell you, however, that many of those people do not enunciate properly. <laughs> Although I have been a member of this fellowship a long time, this may come to a surprise to you. I am not an alcoholic. And if there are any doubting Thomases in this office who would like to take me up on that, I would suggest that you go back to the Massillon State Hospital at Massillon, Ohio, and check the admittance records for 1934 and 1935, and you'll find my name there on two separate, on two separate occasions, <coughs> listed not as an alcoholic. Was a chronic inebriate. I like that so much better. <laughs> Before I became a member of this fellowship, I was able to talk on quite a wide variety of subjects. By using the maximum amount of imagination and the minimum amount of truth, I could come up with some pretty good stories. I could be anything I wanted to be. If you wanted to talk professional football, I was the guy who used to stop Nagurski and Thorpe, those guys. If you want to talk professional baseball, I, I fanned Babe Ruth and Ted Williams, those fellows, nothing to it. If you wanted to talk big game hunting, I was there. Or deep sea fishing, I was there. And I'm sure I could have interested you in my personal experience in space travel. Because long before the world ever heard of the Sputnik, I'd been in orbit many, many times. And I never had to use a rocket to get there. When I came into this fellowship, <coughs> They insist that I must use the maximum amount of truth and the minimum amount of imagination. So you're stuck with a very ordinary talk from a very ordinary drunk who didn't know how to handle his liquor. I didn't get started in my drinking careers early in life as some, but no one can say I didn't make the best of it once I got it going. There were two reasons for my late start. When I was about 13 years old, my favorite uncle died of acute alcoholism. He was not only my uncle, he was my pal, my friend, and I was heartbroken. I still think about what a natural he would have been for AA, but there was no AA available to him at the time. He tried everything he could and he couldn't make it by himself, which makes me feel that I'll never be great, half grateful enough for what AA has done for me. <clears throat> so as a result of his early passing, I went through high school and finished my education, but scarcely knew what liquor tasted like. Uh, now, there was another reason for my late start, and that was my own immediate family. Uh, we had a law in the Spies family. It was just as rigid and just as permanent as any of the laws of the Medes or Persians. When Sunday came, we went to church, period. I remember my mother getting me up and dressed, and I could hardly toddle around, rushing me off to Sunday school. And as soon as I was housebroken, I had to stay for church. That meant from the time I was about that high, there was two or three services on Sunday and during the week. I, they used to say of my father that he was a very ambitious Christian. He wasn't fanatical. But he, they said he was everything but the pastor and the janitor. And he was very generous with my time, especially the work to do around the church. I could dust, if the, if the janitor didn't show up, I could dust the seats and I could <coughs> shovel the snow or I could run errands for the minister. And a lot of things that I, <coughs> that I could do in there. And the rest of the fellows were out learning to throw, throw forward passes or throw knuckleballs. I was looking forward to the time when I could get out, graduate from high school and get away from home and start living the kind of life I wanted to live. But before I got around to graduating, uh, I uh, had a lot of nosy relatives and friends and family. And they began snooping around the family tree. And they noticed there never had been a minister in this family before. And they decided there should be one. And I was it. And everybody was wildly enthusiastic about this but me. I rebelled as much as I could. At that particular stage of my life, my dad was physically fit, used to having his own way, and even more important, he was bigger than I was. So I went to the seminary for a year. When I got away from home, 
I had a chance to do a little thinking for myself. At the end of the first year, I was faced with the most <coughs> serious problem of all my life. I have always believed in God, and I've always believed in Jesus Christ, because I was brought up that way. But I have never been able to quite swallow all the man-made theology that they tried to wrap around Christ's shoulders. And I seriously doubt whether Christ would recognize some of it himself if he were to come back today. Now the problem is this. Shall I go on out <coughs> to become an emissary and go on out and preach things I don't believe and go to hell as a hypocrite? Or shall I come right out and tell them and go to hell as a non-believer? I thought the latter way was better. So one day I mustered up enough courage to get down to the big brass, and I told him that I didn't think I was cut out to be a minister. And you know, much to my surprise, they agreed with me. <laughs> so <clears throat> I uh, left the center, went down to the state and majored in metallurgy. Now, I don't know whether the clergy appreciates this or not. When I walked away from that seminary, I gave the clergy the best damn break they ever had in their lives. They may not preach it, but I know it. I went on to school, scarcely knew what liquor was like. See, there were too many kids in the Spies family. We were only about a year and a half apart, like couples in school at the same time. The money wasn't very plentiful. And I knew if I wanted an education, I couldn't, wouldn't be able to crowd around. So I finished at school, and I, when I was through, I was able to get a job with one of the major steel companies as a research and you know, research laboratory. And I worked there for several years, and still no drinking to amount to anything. But I fell in love with the steel business. And I knew that if I was going to mount anything in the steel business, I would have to get down to the plant, learn how to melt steel, roll steel, and work with the fellows that made, and were, had their hands in it all the time. So I asked for a transfer, and they took me seriously. They transferred to the open heart department as a second helper on an open heart furnace. Now, I don't know how many of you men here are familiar in here are familiar with steel mill practice or not. <coughs> But I can tell you this, regardless of what the Saturday Evening Post may say about it, there's damn little glamour to it. You do your work with a six, with a 16-pound sled, crowbar, and a wheelbar, and it's hot work, and it's damn really hard work. But once you're bitten to that molten metal bug, you never quite get over it. And I <clears throat> went down, and I was very happy to be in the steel plant with the men. Now, they had a slogan down this plant. That if you want to make good look, if you want to make good steel, you have to learn to drink good whiskey. And if you want to sell it to you, you've got to learn to hold your whiskey. Well, it seemed to me that all that stood between me and success was to find some te somebody could teach me how to drink properly. And that wasn't any job at all. There were a lot of apt, very good teachers down there. Very, in fact, everybody was a teacher. And I turned out to be a very apt student. It wasn't long while I was bending my elbow with the best of them. For the first ten years of my life down there in the plant, everything was pretty much of a bowl of cherries. I was promoted over men that were older men than I was, and they didn't seem to object to it, and I think the reason was that I was a pretty good spender, and I was willing to drink with anybody, anytime, anywhere. So the first ten years was pretty much, uh, pretty much all right. I went into the second decade of my drinking, still, still more promotions and more money, which eventually cost me my job. The old man called me in one day and told me that due to the depression, well, falling off borders, they were, they were going to have to abolish my department, and I no longer had a job. Now, that was just a nice way of firing me without using those nasty words. And I was pretty much upset. I was drove right down to the heel. After all, I was a pretty big shot, a pretty big cog in that wheel, at least I thought so. And uh, I was sore about it first, and then I felt sorry for them, because I couldn't understand how they hoped to run that big corporation without me. But you know, somehow or other, they managed. Uh, I saw their, uh, uh, their their trial balance for the past year, not long ago. Despite the fact I haven't been with them for a long time, they seem done pretty well. I'm speaking of the Republic Steel Corporation. <clears throat> well, I made up my mind that I would go on out, and I would get a better damn job than they ever thought of giving to a fellow. And with the luck of an alcoholic, about six weeks later, I was appointed liquidating manager of the bank. Now, unfortunately for me, my interpretation of the word liquidating and their interpretation of the word liquidating didn't jive at all. And about 11 months later, I'm out reading the help wanted ads again. I lost a couple more jobs. Things weren't going so good. The Black Thursday of, uh, in October 1929 when the market crashed, I lost all the money I had. I had made a quite a considerable pile out of the markets when the margins were low and call money was cheap, and I did all right. In fact, my income to the market was far more than my income from the plant. <clears throat> but that all went overnight. 
And uh, along that went not only my all the stock market, but my insurance money and everything along with it. And on top of that, my uh, wife divorced me and took two children away from me. And then came the crowning boy of all. My mother died. Now, I had never been a particularly a mother's boy, nor had she ever tried to dominate my life. But I had never once have gone to her to talk with her. And I didn't, when I came away, that I didn't feel that I was taking some help and some hope with me. And now that she was gone, the world looked pretty black indeed. And then, too, my, my drinking bothered me. <clears throat> I couldn't understand. I knew I wasn't drinking like the other fellows. So one day I drove out in the country, be by myself. And I thought this thing all over and all over, and I came up with a very brilliant conclusion. That it wasn't my fault that I was getting drunk. It was the fault of these lousy bums I was running around with. Those were the fellows that were getting drunk. So why not start life all over again? Go on out where the sky is clear and the air is fresh, <clears throat> pure, and grass is green. Go out there and start your life all over again. So for the next ten years, I roamed all over this country, east, west, north, and south taking this wonderful 10-year geographical cure. Now, the fallacy of that sort of a cure, as most of you know, if you're an alcoholic, you don't walk away from John Barleycorn. John Barleycorn walks right in your shadow. Walk right in your footsteps. And you got, <clears throat> all you have to do is let your bars down, and John's right there with him. When I started on this <clears throat> geographical cure, I had a sort of plan in mind. I was going out and getting myself a new job. A new job. I never had a trouble getting a job. Uh, <clears throat> I started there, and for the first eight or ten weeks, I worked like the very devil. And I attracted attention to the bosses, and uh, I behaved myself. I didn't uh, crowd around. I didn't go out at night. stayed home, so I was able to go to work the next morning. But you know, when you're young, you can't just exactly sit around the, uh, the lobby of the YMCA reading the ladies' home journal every night of your life, you know. There comes a time when you want to go out and find out what's going on in the town, and I never knew a place where I could find out any quicker than down below the bar room. I think people drink pretty much the same <clears throat> the country over. I found there much, wasn't much difference between Boston and Detroit, or Washington and <clears throat> Los Angeles, or even San Francisco or Sacramento. And uh, I know I don't think everyone into this happened. I didn't, couldn't find somebody that knew somebody that I knew. Pretty soon I had the same company of drinking friends around. They always had. And then about the time they would be ready to promote me, I'd be off on a bender with my newly found friends. When I come back, they'd fire me. And then I'd have to start this thing all over again. It seemed to me that I always got drunk at the wrong time, the wrong place, in front of the wrong people. When I was a young man, I worked for, for Benjamin Fairless, the late president, chairman of the board of the United States Steel Corporation, the biggest industrial job in the world. Ben was a very, very democratic fellow. He used to come down to the laboratory and call me by my first name. We talked about the test. But after all, he, at that time, was our general manager. I wasn't running around with him, hobnobbing around, and say anything like it. But he was Mr. Fellows, and I just wanted to help. But one time, at a Christmas party, I felt very much on a par with Ben, and I decided I would call him and wish him a Merry Christmas. So I got him on the phone. He was a little long, longer getting to the phone than he did ordinarily. And when he did get to the phone, he was not quite as pleasant as he had been on former occasions. Now, the hour of the morning might have had something to do with it. It was four o'clock. And I said, Mr. Fellows, this is Dewey Spees, and I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. And he said, quiet, go out, and finally he said, well, Dewey, in fact, Dad, you know, I think you're serious about that. This is the third time since noon yesterday you called to tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, my <clears throat> geographical cure came to a very abrupt close. One day, on Christmas Day, down east, down at the Valley Forge Hotel, I was a periodical drinker. I was on one of my good periods. I had a very good job, a nice place to live. Christmas time came along, and all the other men had homes and families to go to, and poor Dory didn't have it. And I saw I could pity myself like nobody did. It never occurred to me that it was my own fault that I didn't have a home to go, go to. So this particular morning, I went back in down to the bar, and I got a hold of my friend, the bartender, Al, I want you to send up three-fifths to my room. You can't do it. He says, liquor, good liquor is hard to get. Well, I put on one of the best sales talks I ever put on in my life. I told him that I'd spent a lot of money in that bar, and I was going to have a very important party up in my room, and I felt that I was entitled to that liquor. He broke down and sent it up. 
Now, the only thing I didn't tell Al about the party was that I was the only one invited to the party. <laughs> and I'm not sure just what all went on that day. I <clears throat> must have had a strange case of telephonitis because when it came to paying my bill, when I finally got around leaving the place, I had to borrow money to, to get out of the hotel. This, I went to my room and started drinking, and about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the manager of the hotel knew he was in my room, called in and asked me how I was doing. I had developed the hiccups were so violent they were affecting my heart, and I couldn't talk, couldn't answer him. So I took a key and opened the door and took one look and ran to the doctor. When the doc came, I was too ill to move, so they shot something into me, and a couple of hours later, they rushed me off to the hospital. A couple of days later, when the fog lifted, I began to recognize what was going on, <clears throat> my doctor came in and seen me. He was a little short, square-shouldered fellow, so I had a sort of a perverted sense of humor, I thought. And he sat down on the edge of the bed, and he told me that, flat out, that my drinking career had come to the crossroads. Now, you've got to make up your mind whether you want to drink and die, or sober up and live. He said, you're not very well acquainted around this little town here, are you? No, I'm not. He says, well, we have a hell of a nice little graveyard out here at the edge of town. He says, there's nice ivy growing up over the tombstones. There's nice pine trees growing up there, beautiful pine trees. And there's a lot of old revolutionary heroes buried out in that cemetery. And you're working for a reliable company. If you want to drink and die, I think they'll bury you at no cost yourself. And then he walked out. Well, nobody ever talked to me like that before. He really jolted me right down to my heels. That guy really scared me. At least for ten minutes, anyway. <laughs> and then I figured, well, this old brother's just trying to hand me the same old line all the rest of them. But I wasn't too sure. He sounded rather convincing. So I called her son. She was an elderly person, and she said, well, Mr. Speed, I don't believe that you realize how near you came to dying the other night when you came in here. So I knew she was telling the truth. So as much as I like to drink, I like to live better. And you can do a lot of things when you see the old gentleman there with the scythe right in front of your face. So I had this in mind. I drank for ten years, very much like the gentleman. Now, if I lay off this stuff, say, for a year, year and a half, and give Mother Nature a chance to rebuild my system, or to put it a little more bluntly, to put a new lining in my stomach, I couldn't understand why I couldn't continue to drink like a gentleman. That's what I had in mind. And I started out on that premise. And I want to tell you that was the most miserable period of my life, barring none. I got out, I was a salesman. I got out in the club car to train, I was be sitting there with their drinks, talking, laughing, and I'm there sitting, sitting sucking a lousy bottle of ginger ale. And they'd come to me and they wouldn't know what the trouble was, and I'd have to tell them I had a nervous breakdown or an aftermath of the flu. Uh, incidentally, the flu was my favorite disease. I had 17 different varieties, and I needed them, too. <clears throat> then in the evening when we'd come off the road and in the hotel, the lights were low and the women were beautiful, and they always beautiful when the lights are low. There I am with my lousy bottle of ginger ale. Jeez, it was, I tell you, it was terrible. But I get my teeth, because I'm a bullheaded guy. I figured I'll stick this thing out for a year and a year and a half, and then I'll show them how to drink. Well, during all this period, I don't know how long this went on, but one morning I had a, I had a letter. So it asked me how I would like to come over to New York and take a job in the Export Steel Sales Division of all companies, the Republic Steel Corporation, a company had fired me years before. Well, I recognized this as a chance to kick back. I promised myself I wouldn't drink on the job. I'm going to make a go of this thing. I kept that promise for <clears throat> about three weeks. And then I began to re <clears throat> rationalize a little bit. After all, my customers were my bread and butter. The other salesmen were buying their customers' likes. And not that I wanted it for myself, you understand. But I didn't seem, it didn't seem to be quite fair that the other salesmen should be buying their customers' drinks, and I wasn't. So... As I say, not because I wanted myself, but because I wanted to be fair with my customers. To drink. That was a mistake to start with, because I soon began to get too many customers. Now, that brings us up to 1939. In 1939, in Akron, Ohio, in Hank Williams' home, there were a group of men, nameless as yet, <clears throat> and they were holding meetings once a week under the auspice of the Oxford Group, which has been defined to me as a non-sectarian <coughs> evangelical group. And there were these group later, this group and then later on came to be known as the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. There were 12 men coming down to those meetings at, at, at Akron once a week. And there was a rumor floating around that these 10 men were planning to separate connections with the Oxford group and go to Cleveland and start a group of their own. You see, there were certain aspects of the 
Oxford group religion that were not satisfactory to some of the alcoholics. And to be very frank with you, there were some of the actions on the part of the alcoholic that wasn't quite satisfactory to the Oxford group, too. <laughs> Nevertheless, <clears throat> Dr. Bob knew about this, and he didn't object to it, but he didn't think the group as a whole was quite mature enough to start out on their own. Nevertheless, these fellows uh, started this group. Now, back in New York, there were some rumors floating on our office that affected me a lot more personally. Now, one morning it happened. An old man called me in and told me that <clears throat> he thought I had a very brilliant written career ahead of me. And he thought it was a shame to have anything as prosaic as a job to mar that brilliant written career. And that he was going to arrange a separation for me from my company that I might devote 95% of my time, my time drinking instead of only 93. And I'm out of the job again. And I don't know what to do. So I did what an alcoholic does when he doesn't know what to do. I went out and got drunk for six weeks. And then something happened. I suppose in the life of every one of us, there comes times when some little thing happens. You may look back in the after years and call it incidental. <clears throat> and I may have called this incidental at a time, but I don't anymore. I think this something was happening that was answers probably to somebody's prayers for me. Because <clears throat> six weeks after I had been fired, jobs, export sales, I was in Cleveland, Ohio, district sales manager of an industrial chemical company. Now, I don't know anything about industrial chemicals, period, excepting as a layman. So here I am. I didn't want to leave the East. I want to stay in the East. I'm in a city I didn't want to live in. I'm on a job I don't know anything about. I can't call that coincidental. <clears throat> I started out of this job. First place, I was able to get to a place to live with a very wealthy lady in Lakewood, Ohio, who thought I was a perfect gentleman because she thought I did. She wanted somebody in the house that didn't drink, and I told her I didn't. Now, I didn't miss some of the details, but uh, at any rate, she thought I was quite all right. And this job started to pay out right away. Not the uh, best thing, best job I ever had. Everything cracked right. I made big money from the start. Now I'm on the way back. I've got the thing licked. No more of this, no more of this petty foolish stuff. I'll, I'll mind my business and I'll make a go of this thing. I kept on working and orders began coming in and everything was going fine. And then, maybe six weeks later, I started getting blue spells, disgusted and, and uh, down the mouth. I thought uh, my customers didn't appreciate me. My boss didn't appreciate me. And nobody did. Everybody was talking about it, nobody liked me, and so on and so forth. And nothing was further from the truth because I was getting along better now than I'd ever been in my life before. Well, this got so bad that finally I had to go to a doctor. And the doctor gave me a very thorough examination. Much to my surprise, when he finished, he told me there was nothing organically wrong with me. I had a little low blood pressure, and that's what caused these blues and despondent spells. So he asked me flat, flat out, he said, do you drink speeds? Oh, certainly not. You know, the very idea. <coughs> so I could, uh, he, he suggested that I go down to the liquor store and get a quart of good brandy. And I should take one drink a day. That's all. Before my dinner. Take a good drink and then put the all away and forget about it. Well, you know, up to that time, I, I could take doctors or leave them. I didn't have too much for them because they knew too much about me. But here was a doctor I liked. You know, he had a hell of a lot of good common sense, this guy. And I burned the rubber off my heels getting down to that store and getting this bottle of brandy. And I did what he told me to do for one week, religiously. One drink before my dinner. Of course, I didn't want to cheat myself. My drink uh, amount is about that much in a water glass. <laughs> By the time I was shaved up the restaurant, this kick was kicking around, the world began to look a little rose tinted again. I thought I had everything under the bridge. Next week I started fooling around with nightcaps. I get in bed and get a book, and then I would get a take a big slug of liquor, and then I just ooze off into sleep. And that was wonderful for a couple nights. And finally one day I met a fellow in the street, damn him, and he <clears throat> said, How about a beer? Well, you know, beer never hurt anybody, so we went in and had a beer. And when he went in, he said, How about a shot? Well, I thought, we'll make it a small one now, because I got this wing licked, and we're not going to get drunk, and I'm not going to spoil this. So we had a beer and a shot, and we had a shot and a beer. And we had a beer and a shot, and three weeks later, the old lady who thought I was a perfect gentleman was trying to get me out of that house, trying to find some way to get me out of there without calling the cops so she wouldn't be embarrassed. And then something else happened. It was a bit unusual that I might have called coincidental. 
In the city of Cleveland, upwards of, say, upwards of three quarters of a million people, there were 12 men trying to find the way, uh, trying to start an AA group. My landlady didn't, wasn't a drinking woman. She's a very religious person. But she had a brother who worked downtown in an office. And this brother had a secretary who was engaged to a cousin of a brother-in-law of a sister-in-law way around the bush of one of these 12 fellows. These A's were trying to start a group. And that's how I made my first contact with A. I have to remember just as well now as it happened yesterday. This happened on Sunday. I'd been in my room all day and stretched across the bed for the simple reason that I was too drunk to stand up. But I wasn't alone in that room. There was a miniature Sousa band in that room. These fellows were about that high. They had black beards and red uniforms and shiny instruments, and they marched from underneath my bed, up over top of me, down the other side, around, round, 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 playing the stars and stripes forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I want to tell you, fellas, I've never heard that piece played like that before and or since. <laughs> and I hope to God I never do again. Because after three or four hours, the stars and stripes forever begins to taste the keg, you know. Uh, and they were still playing it when the knock came at the door. And before I get to the door to answer, in stepped the holy ruler himself, Mr. A.A. I never heard the term before. I didn't know what it was all about. <clears throat> but he said he understood I had a drinking problem. And uh, he was from AA. He <clears throat> liked to talk to me about it. Well, he mentioned a, a drinking being a problem. I knew he was a spoiler then there. I had a, a half a piece of land uh, down on my bed, right, right with the hand of, end of my arm. And uh, I told him, I said, now, when I want a drink, all I have to do is reach down and pick up a bottle. It's no problem at all. He didn't laugh that one off a little bit. And then in my wildest drunken imagination, I couldn't figure out what in the hell an automobile club had to do with cutting out drinking. I told him so. Well, he was a pretty patient guy, and he explained that there's only two A's in this room. And then he started to talk. And could he talk? And did he talk? I think he was vaccinated with some kind of recording needle because he just kept on going. And I was hoping he would stop because I was due for a drink and I didn't want to drink in front of him because he sounded a little bit like a minister. So I did the next thing, best thing. I passed out. And the next morning I was waking up in the sanitarium south of Cleveland and the first horrible thing I heard about A was this. Out in the hall, two fellows were painting out there. And one of them said, in AA it's total sobriety the rest of your life. Well, my chin dropped from there clear down here. The rest of my life, he said. <clears throat> as soon as I left, I put on my robe, left the slippers. There was a payphone down the hall about a half a mile down, or at least soon as I that morning. And I finally got down there, and I called this fellow up for me the night before. And I said, now look, I know I'm <clears throat> drinking too much, and I want to do something about it. But I said, hell's bells, let's not go bored with this thing. What do you do on Christmas, or on New Year's Eve, or when you went back to the homecoming game, or on your birthday? You had to have a little whiskey once in a while. He said, no, we don't drink. I said, good God. I said, well, I <clears throat> suppose maybe you could do it. But uh, what would be the percentage? You might as well lay down and die if you couldn't have a little fun. And that was my attitude toward A when I first heard about it. When I was able to get out of the place, he came, my sponsor came around and asked me if I'd like to go to a meeting with him. And I did, not because I had any idea of hooking up such a crackpot fellowship as this. But I did it out of sheer courtesy to my sponsor. He was a devil of a nice fellow, and he probably saved my life. So I went to all oh, probably half a dozen meetings there. And there, there were certain things about it that uh, I conceded sounded all right. That is, if you were an alcoholic. Of course, I wasn't an alcoholic, so it didn't affect me. Now, I have a story to tell her, and my wife is holding ears shut already. I've been telling this story for 29 years. But if you've heard it before, please don't stop me. I still like to tell it. That uh, this talk about <clears throat> not being, not affecting me, Two soldiers up for the uh, physical examination for the discharge. The doctor noticed on the one cheek of one of the boys there was a red rash, in the form of a strawberry, the size of a strawberry, and very really red like a strawberry. The doctor asked him if he gotten that in service. He said, No, he said, about, se about three months before he was born, and his mother was pregnant with him, she developed an intense appetite for strawberries. She ate strawberries, green strawberries, and old slept strawberries, and when he was born, that strawberry appeared on his cheek. She had marked him. Well, the next chap came up for his examination. Doc said, well, what do you think of that fellow's idea? And this guy who made a little sterner stuff, he said, ah, he's a guy, he's nuts. He said, you're taking my own case. About three months before I was born, my mother went down to the city one afternoon and went into the music store. She bought a book of records. 
And as she was leaving the store, she slipped and she fell on the icy sidewalk. And she broke every one of her records. But it didn't affect me, didn't affect me, didn't affect me, didn't affect me, didn't affect me. <laughs> well, I was just as silly as that fellow was. Here I had A right in the palm of my hand. The only thing that would do me any good my drinking and tossed it aside because it didn't affect me. I quit going to the meetings. Fortunately for me, about three weeks later, I put on a bender to handle all the benders. I got a, a touch on one of my... 17 varieties of flu. I can't tell you which one it was. But anyway, I went home, went to bed, and I started drinking in bed. And I drank for nine days. At the end of the nine days, I thought I was waking up one morning, I was convinced that I was going to die. I'd had it. And I'm sure I was, I'm serious about that. I couldn't keep anything on the stomach, and I was in terrible shape. That morning, as I looked at the half-filled bottle, it occurred to me that I, <coughs> at that particular phase of my life, I had a pretty much of an exaggerated opinion of my own intelligence. I might have had a little enough, a little enough common sense to keep it to myself, but at least I thought I had more on the ball than anybody else. But this morning, it occurred to me that I didn't have the brains of a dog. Now, no self-respecting dog would pick at a poison bone time and time and time again, knowing exactly what it would do to him. And that's exactly what I was doing with this bottle of liquor. I knew what would happen to me, and I kept at it. That morning, as I looked at half the bottle thought occurred to me that all the real troubles of my life, I say real troubles, I could trace right down into the next of that bottle. My domestic troubles, my <clears throat> financial troubles, my job troubles, trouble getting along with people. I tried sometimes. When I wasn't drinking, I wasn't in trouble. Or if I did get into trouble, I was able to face it. And I was, I was, I was up against it. I was going up against a stone wall. I thought I had tried everything. I had tried AA and I had tried religion and so forth and so on. And then a thought came to me that a fellow who I knew got into AA only recently, and he I thought he was worse drunk than I was. And he seemed to be doing all right. He seemed to be getting something out of this. And it occurred to me that just possibly I might have missed the boat. Maybe these holy rulers had something. So when I was able to get up and get out of bed on my own steam, I went back to that sanitarium. I went to bed. A couple of days later, my mind cleared up a bit. I went downstairs. I got a hold of a fellow around the place. My bill... I want you to come over here, I want you to sit down with me, and tell me from scratch all there is to know about AA. And he laughed at me. He said, you remember me as you were down here a couple of weeks ago, and you were telling us how to run it. <laughs> you see, I had this in mind, that uh, if they would get a full of the thoughts with some promotional ideas, a little bit of writing glory, and they'd take a lot of this God stuff out of that book, <clears throat> and rewrite the thing, and adopt sort of a middle road policy, give the... Don't be so rigid about it. And give the fellows a drink a little beer once in a while. Of course, not on meeting nights or anything like that, but once in a while. Have it. And you know, they didn't go for that with the crest. So if they don't want to go for it, well, right, let them run it themselves. And they did. <clears throat> I thought I would quit and give them a chance to catch up with me, and they did that too. So I, <clears throat> I'm in this thing again. So I built a to me and he said, you were out here. You remember you were telling us how to run this thing. I said, Bill, will you forget that? I'd like to know this time. And I'll never forget how kindly that fellow was. After taking all my lip only a few weeks before, he sat down there in that bed afternoon and told me about AA. And this is what he said. He said, AA is a spiritual fellowship. And we believe that if we live in such a way as to deserve it, we can get spiritual help to control our drinking. He said, control, not cure. And then almost in the same breath, he pointed out that it was very important for me to go on out and help somebody else get, <coughs> get, uh, control their drinking. He laid out a little plan for me. He suggested that every morning when I left the house that I would have a little prayer, a little meditation, and ask God to stay sober that day. And then at night, to express my gratitude in prayer. Well, <clears throat> that was all right, except for one thing. I couldn't pray. You see, when I walked out of that seminary here before, I turned my back on God. I turned my back on all the good things my parents taught me, all the good things everybody else tried to teach me. I lived my life for myself. Now that I dug the hole right down the bottom, myself, I didn't have the guts to pray. I thought it would be a sacrilege. But I knew I had to do something, because I was at the end of my rope. So I came into A on this basis. I figured it out I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. I was sure these fellows couldn't make a worse mess out of my life than I made out of myself. So I would win to A for 30 days, and I would do it, whatever they told me to do, and mechanically if I had to. If I had to walk around at night at midnight smoking a cigar, wearing a kitty hat, I'd do that too. 
So I, I knew I had to do something. So I, that was the basis that I came into virtually dared them to sober me up. I went to my first meeting on my own, and I sat on my hands to keep from falling off the chair. And when the meeting was over, Dr. Bob came over. He said, well, what do you think of it? I said, well, Doc, I, I feel like a kid going to school again. He said, that's about what it amounts to. He said, this is a, an AA is an, edu- is an, an educational institution. He said, there's no provisions made for the teacher to resign, no provisions made for the pupil to graduate. He said, we're both the pupils and the teacher. And he told me that night that it was just as important for me to pray as it was to preach, and just as important to learn as it was to teach. And he quoted me a little verse from Pope's essay. He said, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not of this Pyrenean spring, where shallow dust intoxicate the brain, and drinking deeply sobers us again. Now, I said, I want you to get on and stay with the fellows that know something about this program. Stay with the fellows that are working at it and learn all you can. Well, that wasn't as easy as it sounded, because at that particular time, Bill and Doc were the only ones that really knew what the score was. There were a hell of a lot of us, and they, at that time, didn't even know it was a game on. So I started going back to the meetings, and there was a terrible experience. I was nervous, excitable. I heard a lot of things I didn't agree with, things I didn't want to hear. I still hear things, a lot of things in the AA that I don't want to hear and that I don't agree with. But I've learned since that I can put aside that which I don't want for temporary for keep it for further reference. And uh, I was scared to death when I suddenly realized one day how nearly, how close I came to damaging my brain permanently. When I was in school, I had a phenomenal memory. I could read and memorize as I went along. I never took notes. Now, I can't remember what I did yesterday afternoon or yesterday morning. It was that close. And this was a terrible thing to face up to. And this was, these were terrible days. And while uh, during this terrible period, when it was touch and go, whether I would be able to stick it out or not, these words came to help me. They must have been back in my subconscious mind for a long time. When I was a youngster, I used to pump a pipe organ for a church. And I got a half a dollar a Sunday. And I never paid any particular attention to what the minister said out there in front. I was in the back of that screen trying to figure out what I could buy for 50 cents. Kids could buy something for 50 cents then. Well, one day he said, when you pray, give us this day our daily bread. He said, be sure your table cloth's clean, and then you'll have a better chance of getting your daily bread. And I knew then and there, I knew then and there, why I never got help from prayer before. Certainly I prayed like a son of a gun. I remember the First time I got in jail for drinking, oh boy, I thought there was going to be headlines in the paper, and I prayed that night, and I prayed and prayed. See, I had in mind my Sunday school lesson that I heard when I was a boy about the time the early Christians were put in jail. And through their prayers and prayers of those outside, the bars dropped off the jail lids, and they walked out free men. Well, I tell you, I never prayed a jail, uh, bar or jail door in my life, and I had no faith in prayer, because if I, somebody didn't come down with a $15 in cost, I stayed there. And I didn't, I, when I, another uh, <coughs> peculiar of mine, when I got broke, I used to pray for a pocketbook with $60 in it. Now, don't ask me why it wasn't 40 or 70 because I don't know. I wanted $60, and I never found more than two bits in my life. So that's why I had no faith in prayer. But when this, he said, those words came back to me, <coughs> you pray, give us, us this day our daily bread, sure you take it with I knew then and there that I was going to expect to God to help me with my sobriety. I'm going to have to start up cleaning this tablecloth. Now, I've been cleaning at it for 29 years, and believe it or not, there's still spots on it, and it's probably just as well that there are. If I had been able to clean it quite little white in 15 years, I doubt whether I would have, would have had the insanity to keep on going with AA. But as long as there are spots on that tablecloth, I'm going to be an active AA as long as I'm physically and mentally able of, of doing so. Doc left me that night, gave me one parting shot. Now look, one thing you'll remember, don't take your arithmetic, don't finish, start with your algebra, you finish taking your arithmetic. And I interpret that to mean I should put first things first. So I started out on that basis doing everything people told me to do. I was in such a position, I had no choice, I had to accept. So <clears throat> they come on, and I heard things, one of the things that annoyed me a great deal was that Everybody in the place started telling me that I must work the program, but nobody told me how. They, uh, well, the first meeting I went to, one fellow got up and told me, Thomas, he literally drank while he was, before he came in the day. 
Another New England man told me what a good job he had gotten through AA. Another one told me <clears throat> uh, how many jails he'd been in and so forth. And about the fourth night, I got up and I said, look, and I said, if you're going to tell stories, don't let me in on it. I can tell you some pretty good ones myself, but I want to know how to work the program. <laughs> Well, I didn't know at the time, but I, I was a member of a stuffed shirt group, and the beginners were not supposed to talk for the first three or four months, six months up the way. So I guess they decided they would put the quietus on me and put me in my place. Because the next Sunday morning, at six o'clock in the morning, I got a telephone call. Zero weather, blizzard going on outside. And some of all had some hillbilly who had been drinking since he was 13 years old, <clears throat> wanted to suddenly decide to quit drinking, written in New York. And the call was re uh, returned back, and I got the call. And uh, incidentally, that was only one of the first. Whenever they had a man who was too tough and nobody wanted to bother him, I got the call. They were going to quiet me down. Well, I started out looking for this fellow that morning, and I hunted for him. And finally, I found him and his wife, a little boy, in one of the most terrible po uh, poverty-stricken places you ever saw in your life. There were three of them living in one room. And over on the windowsill, there was a half a loaf of bread, a half a bottle of milk. That had been on menu for days. She had the, the whips packed and was ready to leave. I finally got her quieted down. She agreed to give me another chance. And I remember talking to the little boy. He was crying in the corner. He, every time he opened his mouth, he had it slapped shut. I got him quieted down. And then I went over to talk to the man. He was sitting on the edge of the bed, shaking as I had never seen a man shake before. At first, I thought he had St. Vitus dance. And he shook and shook and shook. It was my first call, and I was nervous and... and I'm embarrassed, and uh, I don't know what I said to him. And I'm damn sure he didn't know what I said to him either. But when I got up to go, he followed me out the door and said, Can you come back tomorrow? Yes, I will be back tomorrow. I'm going to get this cookie. I went back the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And finally this fellow quit shaking and went back to work. <clears throat> About two weeks after that, I went down to their house one night, and she met me at the door. She was all fresh with excitement. Look, look, he gave it all to me. She showed me the first industrial paycheck she had ever seen. He'd always found time to cash it on the way home. She never knew how much money he made. And he told me it's all mine. I'll run a suit myself. She was beginning to get something out of AA. In the next three months, the whole marvelous miracle of AA unfolded right before my very eyes. About two weeks later, two or three weeks later, I went down and the little boy came out. I laid down a little pair of shoes and romper suit in the top coat. He looked up at me and he said, Mr. E, he says, my dad got these for me. He said, I ain't scared of them anymore. And then, for the first time in my life, I began to realize how many people, other than ourselves, we hurt when we drink to excess. I had a little boy and a little girl. No doubt I had hurt them just as the same. It still hurts to talk about it. But the little boy was getting something out of this now. Three months passed. He called me. He said, we moved. I went down. I stood on the porch that night for a rat on the bell. It wasn't the palace. It wasn't the mansion. A nice little cottage, and there were drapes and curtains at the window, and rugs on the floor. And where I was standing, I could look straight back in the kitchen, and I saw a great, nice, shiny refrigerator with honest-to-God food in it. And these people thought a modern miracle had happened. This fellow hadn't had a drink for three months. He was up there in front with his boy, at the, sitting at the table, helping him with his lessons. And she was sewing to listen to the radio, and they couldn't believe it. And I never saw happiness shine out of people's eyes like shine out of their eyes that night. And that night, I became an AA in fact. Up to that time, I was only registered. Because my age, I was, I was still doubting whether it would be worthwhile for me to try to stay sober the rest of my life. I lived a pretty rotten sort of a life. And I felt that people always remember that. They'd always look at me as that no good so-and-so. But that night, there seemed to be a little patch of blue in the sky. Because it occurred to me that perhaps now, if I could forget my own troubles, and try to bring a little happiness to the lives of other people, maybe I could become people too. And it worked out very nicely for me. Not long after that, the Saturday evening post articles came out, and people began to flood into Cleveland from all parts of the country. In fact, Cleveland began the, became the hub of AA activity, because it was a little closer to the rest of the country than New York, and a little more accessible than Akron. And people from all parts of the country came in there. At night we'd go home from work, it would be... Ten men at the Statler Hotel, some more, eight more at the hot, at the, at the other hotels. And they pressed us in the service regardless of how much experience you had. It wasn't a question whether you wanted to work, you had to work. And uh, I want to say this to the younger people here tonight who are coming into this thing. I've never given advice. 
The only advice I ever gave was don't take any advice from me, you might get drunk. But <clears throat> if I'm coming into this thing, I can tell you this, that your best defense against that first drink is activity in AA. Being active somewhere, helping put the chairs up, helping clean out the ashtrays. There's no menial tasks in the AA. They're all worthwhile. This is worthwhile as the fellow stands up and pops off for half an hour. And, and, and some pay, some say that you can go to meetings and sit there and it'll wear off on you. But I'm here to tell you that if you start taking it internally, it'll work a lot more faster. And, <clears throat> so, that's what I would do. If I were coming in a new man night, I would go up to the secretary and I would just pester the hell out of him when he gave me some kind of a job, regardless of what it was. And I think he would thank you for it afterwards. <clears throat> so, I'm getting I'm back into my regular routine of AA. I'm, I'm beginning to see a little daylight. Things are beginning to ooh, just take a little shape. I've got a man now that I sponsor, and he's doing all right. It sort of got in my blood. I guess like a salesman, the first time he goes out and gets a big order in the first call. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna dry up the world. I'm gonna evangelize the whole world. I Shanghai fellows <laughs> off the bar stool. And I brought them home to my house. We fed them. We, and I say we. My wife cooked for them. <laughs> we sewed clothing on them and so forth. And finally one day, when I was out in the southern part of the state, I called in to get a price and she told me I had better get home. Because she had three, three of my babies in the living room, and they were all drunk, and three was about all she could handle. So I learned the hard way that you don't do it that way. But I did. I was all confused by it. I, and the pieces of my life, the like little crossword, well, the jigsaw puzzle began to fit together, began little pictures began to appear. But there was one thing that bothered me a lot. From the time I had gotten in the AA, I heard people stand up, and give the most wonderful experience, uh, tell about the most wonderful religious, uh, spiritual experiences they'd ever had. And they were marvelous to listen to. And damn it, I never had one. I never, I never heard the angels fluttering over my shoulders, and I used to listen for them. And I never heard them singing nice songs when I went to bed at night, like some of the fellows said. And it bothered me. I remember when Bill used to come out to visit with Doc, they'd come from him, and Bill's told us many times. How, when he was in the hospital the last time, and he thought he was going to die, and one afternoon he got out of bed, <coughs> kneeled on the side of the bed and prayed to God, if there was a God, to help him. And then, he said, to use Bill's own words, he suddenly, it seemed that the lights in the room flared up into a dazzling, blinding white light, brilliant light. And he fancied he was standing off on a hill somewhere, way off in the distance, and the wind was blowing through him, cleansing his body and his soul. And then he was really scared because he thought he was going crazy. When Dr. Silkworth came back in the room, he asked Bill about it, or to ask Doc about it, and if Doc had been a less kindly, less kindly and understanding man, told Bill that he was nuts, that would have been the end of the AA right then and there. But Doc was kind enough and sit up to admit that once or twice during his career as a physician and surgeon, that people with so-called incurable diseases suddenly have those diseases arrested by some unknown power. And he told Bill, I don't know what you have, Bill, but whatever it is, for God's sake, hang on to it. Well, <clears throat> I go home at night, I flop down in our old the Davenport, and I watch our old chandelier, and I watch it, and I watch it, and watch it. <laughs> Nothing ever happened, and that's why a bulb would burn out. <clears throat> that's about all. And I didn't feel too good about it. If they could flare up with Bill, why the hell couldn't they flare up for me once in a while? <laughs> Christmas time came along. Still no spiritual time. I went home, passed up the Christmas party. Help my wife, or at least I went home. About four o'clock in the afternoon, she went out to deliver some gifts, and I went in my upstairs, in my own den, to do a little meditating, like a little inventory. And as I was walking up the stairs, the thought occurred to me: the first time since drinking had been a problem, I was sober and reasonably happy in my sobriety. Now I wasn't giggling down my sleeve or anything like that, but I had a nice inner feeling that everything was going well. I was getting along well with my wife, my boss, my neighbors. My salary was ample enough to encourage me <clears throat> good living. I began to tear that thought apart. Now, my parents couldn't do that for me. The doctor couldn't do it for me. The psychiatrist and the clergy couldn't do it. And needless to say, I couldn't do it myself. So with me, it was just a matter of mere deductive reasoning. I must be getting help from somebody, someplace. And then I remember what Bill had told me at the sanitarium, that this was a spiritual fellowship, and that we lived in such a way as to deserve it, we would get spiritual help to control our drinking. I went up into the room. I picked up one line dictionary. I looked up the word spiritual. All it said was pertaining to heavenly. Then I looked up the word heavenly. 
and said, pertaining to the good. And I put the book down. I thought to myself, I wonder if that's it. If we live good, we think good, we pray to a good God, if we choose the good from the bad, if we start living the life somewhere along the lines that our mother taught us to live when we were tapping around our evil sin, wouldn't it necessarily mean that we were living a spiritual life? I figured out this. If a man, let's say a man, a boy, acts like a man, he's a manly fellow. And I began to feel that day that if I acted good, or good, which is synonymous with God, it wouldn't it follow that I was living a spiritual life? And I took it that because it was simple, and I like to keep my A simple. It made it a little easier for me to go to talk to the men who were still in bed in the throes of alcoholism and tell them they need not fear this word spiritual anymore. Just come on out and live the good life. Now, when I came into AA, I didn't come in for any spiritual awakening. I didn't come in for religion or anything. I wanted to get rid of my drinking. That's all. But in gaining my sobriety, I gained a new concept of God. My first concept of God, I think I got from a Sunday school leaflet. He was standing on a cloud, uh, sitting on a golden throne way out in the cloud. And the angels were playing harps all around him. And that's about as close as I ever came to God, somebody way off in the distance. A has given me a different <coughs> view of things. I like to think of A now, of <coughs> God now as a great power. That's, <coughs> that's exercising itself over my life. I, I think I have the feeling that I can be as close to that power as I deserve to be. And if I'm not as close to God tonight as I was six weeks ago, two months ago, or three months ago, I'm the one that's moved because I, I know forever now that he's forever constant. And if I were to ask God tonight for a very special favor, I couldn't ask for anything finer. Just the privilege of carrying this AA message up to my very last hour on this earth. Because then and only then will I know whether I really made this program. I like to think of, <clears throat> of God as my friend. Not as my forebears taught me. I don't believe God, the path God chose for us to live, to lead, to go by, is a cross to bear and a burden to carry. I think it's a blueprint and we're very fortunate to have it. I think once we live in, learn to live in the stride, get in the stride, God's way for us can be just as comfortable as an old shoe and just as practical as a kitchen chair. I like to think of God <clears throat> as a great light that shines across my life. All I have to do is face that light and the shadows will have to fall back on me. It's as simple as that. Now, if you'll bear with me for one more minute, I want to turn the pages of AA back a while, the early days of AA, and I'm not going to be very long with it. <clears throat> when I came into this fellowship, we had no traditions, we had no, no guides of any kind. Every problem, every new problem came up was, satis was settled by trial and error, and sometimes we became very nearly resorting to our fists, and that's not the way to win friends and influence people. We fought about this, and we fought about that. They used to kill us. They said the only thing we could agree on that there was two sides to every question, our side and the wrong side. And it was during this terrible time when, when the, uh, we began to wonder whether we were ever able to get A up off the road, off the floor. We didn't cut out this fighting. And those unhappy circumstances gave birth to the idea of, sta of standardizing, <coughs> setting a set of standards or <coughs> which later came to be known as the Twelve Traditions of AA. And believe me, it was a, it was a strict adherence to those Twelve Traditions saved AA's life. And they're not, nonetheless important, less important now than they were then. <clears throat> I, the longer I remain in AA, the more conscious I become of my duty, my personal responsibility, to maintain and preserve those traditions so that the alcoholic tomorrow will have the ch same chance for sobriety that I have today. Surely this must be the this must be the responsibility of every man and woman who has ever gained gained sobriety through the help of AA. If Abraham Lincoln had been in AA, I think he would express his opinion of our common problem, common responsibility, in a manner something like this. One score and thirteen years ago, our co founders came forth with a new plan, conceived in love and service, and dedicated to the proposition that the alcoholic can be restored by the grace of God and the help of enlightened AAs. Today, we are engaged in a great humane effort to make that plan available to all who may be concerned. But we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot further this plan by mere word of mouth, but rather by assuming our individual and non-transferable responsibility 
of personally carrying the message of AA to those who still suffer. The world will little note nor long remember who we are or what we are. But what we do here will never be forgotten. It is for us who are willing and able to ever increase our efforts in this great field of endeavor without hope of gain, reward, or recognition. It is ours to hold high the torch and to work with increased devotion to the unfinished task which lies before us. And it is for us to highly resolve that this new lease on life, granted by God, shall not have been given in vain, and that this fellowship of AA, by AA, and for AA shall not perish from this earth. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.